Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast, episode nine of the kind of career pathway. Wow, freaking, until you break it up into sections like this, it, it didn't seem that long, but good Lord. Um, all right, so when we, when we kind of finished up last time, we had finished the 2005 trip to Iraq, came back, was fortunate enough to get into Sephardic, and uh, that's where I met Mike Glover. Actually, I'm going to post a picture on here on the on the YouTube channel of of us in Sephardic together. I remember seeing Mike, and he's a uh, he, he's kind of a a guy you you we you would notice because he's very outspoken, but pretty funny. And I remember thinking that Chinese guy is pretty funny. <laughs> I'm joking. I knew he's Korean. Um, but you know, Sephardic is a nine week CQB hostage rescue school breaching. Um, fast roping out of helicopters, breaching doors, taking out buses and trains and all kinds of really cool stuff that that's why you you joined the army, right? Or at least most people. The Sephardic is, uh, at the time, was funded by JSOC to feed the SIF companies. So because I, I got Sephardic qualified, I, I, I moved over to SIF company. Now, let me explain what a SIF company is just for context or what it was back then. SIF stands for Commanders and Extremist Force. They changed the name later on to CRIF, Crisis Response Force, but it was the same thing, and it's part of JSOC. Now, in the grand scheme, in SOCOM, Special Operations Command, encompasses all special operations for the U.S. military. Navy, Air Force, Marines, Army, everybody's all in SOCOM, right? Now, Army Special Forces is USASOC, United States Army Special Operations Command. That encompasses Special Forces, Green Berets, Delta Force, Ranger Regiment, 160th Aviation, Night Stalkers, and, and a few other units. Um, JSOC is kind of certain elements of each pulled out into, into a, a kind of tip of the spear task force. In JSOC at the time was Delta Force, Ranger Regiment, SEAL Team 6, um, and the SIF companies from uh, each group and a few other units there there are five active duty groups in army special forces uh each one has one company designated as a sif company as a strike force for hostage rescue they have all the same army gear as people in the army they have all the same gear as other odas and then they have specialized equipment specialized training and schooling and more money for training than other ODAs. So at the time I went there, they were starting to get their get their fight on in Iraq. And that's where the fight was, and that's where I wanted to be. And it was a different type of fight than Afghanistan because it was in the house, literally in the same room with these guys. And when you go to a unit funded by JSOC, you get all those assets. Um, so equipment-wise, we had cry-precision uniforms. We had... Uh, mini guns on our trucks. Later on, all ODAs, or not all ODAs, but a lot of other ODAs got mini guns. But at the time, we were the only ones had them. SR-25s, uh, gas guns, uh, Glocks, um, Sprinter vans, different camo to, to support that hostage rescue mission. Now, Delta Force is the premier national mission force for hostage rescue, but the way the SIFs and the reason the SIFs were set up like this is because they were supposed to be forward deployed. And some of the SIFs were early on. 10th group were in Germany and still are. Um, seventh group were in Panama. And I, I don't remember anybody else being forward deployed. But the theory was, if something took place in Europe, let's say, or in South America, the SIF companies were already there. They could secure the scene, put snipers in place, um, get an assault team ready that had the training and equipment and experience. And if, while Delta Force is flying from the States over to take over the mission, um, the, SIF, the SIF company was ready and able to do a hasty assault if it went south. If they started killing hostages and we had to go in and Delta weren't there yet, then the SIF companies would go in, okay? Once Delta got there, they would take over the scene uh, the SIF would move into a secondary role and it becomes the, the national mission forces thing. That was the theory, right? The problem is the SIFs were, were not really forward deployed. Um, 
Seventh group moved back from Panama. The only one was the tenth group. Um, in two thousand six, it it kind of went away from that whole thing, and fifth group and third group did most of the trips to Iraq. Uh, the other three, first group, tenth group, and seventh group, took the whole SIF hostage rescue thing a whole lot more serious than fifth and third. Um, we just wanted to basically go to war, so. Um, I got into Sephardic, got qualified, and then made that transition over to SIF company, me and Mike at the same time. I, I remember going over there and asking the company star major, and he he wanted me to get permission from my company star major, who said no. So I went to battalion sergeant major, and he said yes. So I burned that bridge, so I basically wasn't going back there. But when I got there, it was an instant change, the team I was going to, I went straight to the sniper team. So each troop, it's split up into two troops with, with three ODAs in each, in each troop, two assault teams and one sniper team. And there's 12 in each. So uh, I went to the snipes because of my background and I instantly, the guys on that team were just warriors and wanted to get it on and very professional. Uh, accountability was great. Personal responsibility, very, very mature, very experienced team. And the thing about the SIF is, um, and later on I was a team sergeant in it, but uh, you have very experienced guys and generally guys go to the assault teams first and then later on they go to the snipes. And so you have very, the snipes are very, very, very experienced guys, but um, still part of special forces, still ODA construction kind of structure, um, but kind of a different mission. And it pissed people off because when you think about it, if you're the SIF in third group was in second battalion. So if you're a battalion commander of second battalion and first battalion is in Afghanistan and you're relieving them, you have only two companies and they've got three. So you have two companies taken over from three because they couldn't touch the SIF company. And everybody wanted to control of the SIF and nobody wanted to help the SIF or fund it. So you're like in the middle a lot. Um, I hit it at the perfect timing because we got pulled into that JSOC mission in Iraq. So we deployed in 2006. Mike was on um, an assault team and I was on a sniper team. We went in, uh, we took over from 7th Group, I think, and we started working with the Iraqi Counter Terrorist Force. Um, the, before I went, I was fortunate enough to go down to Todd Hodnett's to Accuracy First and, and do a shooting course down there for a couple of weeks. Um, learned a ballistic calculator. Talk about we were the first group ever to go to Todd Hodnett's place. And Todd, if you don't know him, Todd has basically revolutionized and modernized long-range shooting in the military and, and across a lot of uh, different military units and uh, even foreign units. Um, so I got down, got to go down there and shoot, learn the ballistic calculator, learn to shoot in high winds. Um, that, that was a phenomenal trip. <laughs> I went back, I've been at Todd's like, I don't know, 15 times over the years. And part of Todd's safety brief, he talks about don't be drinking and driving and blah, blah, blah. And then he said, don't be shooting from the highway. And <laughs> that is uh, specifically due to us because... When he briefed us, and we were the first group there, he said, if you see a coyote, they're a pest here, and you can shoot them, right? It was legal to shoot them. So he didn't specifically say that you had to be on the range to shoot them, which he meant. So we we're driving down the highway in Texas, and, we, and somebody sees a coyote, and we pull over to the side, and we all jump out with our sniper rifles and just start blasting um, off the hood of the cars. And people are driving past, and it's Texas, and it's rural Texas, and they were like, that's a cool rifle, man. What kind of rifle is that? That's my best American accent. Um, but yeah, after that, Todd was like, yeah, don't shoot from the highway. You shoot on the range. Um, but Todd's a really good friend of mine and uh, has really done a lot for the sniper community. And I'll talk more about that when I get into me working at sniper school. Um, once we deployed in 06, we went to the Iraqi Counter Terrorist Force, which was stood up by 5th and 3rd Group, brought in, selected, brought to Jordan, trained and trained and trained and equipped and then brought back into Iraq. And they've done fantastic things there. They really did. That is the, like the biggest success story of the SIFs really is the, the formation and, and building of the Iraqi Counter Terrorist Force and ISAF Brigade. When ISIS invaded Iraq, the ISAF Brigade 
and specifically the Archie counter terrorist force were the ones who stood and fought and stopped them in their tracks. They died in big numbers, but they killed in big numbers too. Other than that, the ISIS would have taken Baghdad and probably rolled into Kuwait, and it would have been a much bigger problem. So when people look back at the SIFs and its change kind of construct, you know, it, it's been built differently now, but that was the biggest thing we did. And the ICTF were very, they were well-educated, they were physically fit, most of them spoke English, and they were they were pretty hardcore guys with a lot of combat time. Um, very impressive unit. So we rolled in there, and we become a troop advisor to them. And, and you know, these boys are, are, are very experienced, so you're just you're helping them, you're building rapport. Your, your uh, rapport is huge in the Middle East. You have to be part of the team. So uh, we go in there, we start working ICTF, we start rolling into Sadr City on missions. Um, Sadr City was a Shia enclave in Baghdad, and it was a thorn in Saddam Hussein's side. Saddam Hussein is a Sunni Muslim, and Shia and Sunni are not fans of each other. Probably like Catholics and Protestants, probably in Northern Ireland. But, um, you know, the whole Iran-Iraq war in the 80s and the Shia in Baghdad were kind of second-class citizens. They were funded by Iran, the, the Mahdi militia. And I remember a, 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 an Iraqi soldier telling me that he'd been on hits in Shia, in uh, Sadr City, with Saddam's army and Saddam's policy was one every house gets at least one hand grenade right that was him he's brutal right um, so we're rolling in we're going after high value targets in Sadr City Sadr City at the time nobody was going into Sadr City really and we would roll in there with armored vehicles strikers um, tanks sometimes and we uh, generally you'd get in a little bit of a scuffle going in but once you're in, they'd put out all their IEDs and they'd hit you on the way out and you'd get in a massive gunfight. Mini guns would go dry, Apache gunships would be shooting. It was just an insane battle in a very small area of Baghdad and a very small violent area of Baghdad. So we did some missions there for a couple of weeks and then six of us from two or three different teams got pulled and sent to the emergency response unit of the Baghdad police. And we were told that these guys are the equivalent of the FBI HRT team, which they weren't. They may have been in, in their duties and responsibilities, but they were not in their capability. Not great, not not a very good unit. Now, there were SEAL platoon working with them already and some guys from 5th Group. And this was the start of the change where the chain of command uh, wanted to put an Iraqi face on everything and they wanted to start getting these guys to do their own stuff and do their own missions. So um, the SEALs were not really doing that and it wasn't that they weren't capable, it's they just didn't want to and they felt more comfortable with Americans on target, which I get. So they would have, they would go on a mission with eight vehicles. They'd pull up to the target, they'd have one Iraqi in the back of each vehicle They'd all run in, hit the target, and the Iraqi's job was to jump in the driver's seat, turn the vehicle around so he could leave, and then jump in the back again, okay? So they had no role, and you're really not empowering them to take over. So we were briefed, and we were told in no uncertain terms to get this unit ready to do its own stuff, to do its own hits, to do its own planning, to do its own driving and gunning, and blah, blah, blah. So we went down there, and there was a lot of SEALs there, and... um. The SEALs had done an 18-month train-up for that deployment. That's very common for them. We didn't do that. We didn't have time. Our train-up was the mission we just did. I spent nine months in Baghdad or in Mosul before I went there. I did a little bit of training and came back. And that train-up was the train-up for the next one and the next one. So they did a lot of train-up. And um, they, uh, the, the whole FID thing was not really their thing, right? So everybody had specific missions before 9-11. SF, unconventional warfare, foreign internal defense, right? Delta, direct action, strike force, SEALs, water, uh, naval stuff, Ranger Regiment, strike force, infantry strike force. When, when the war on terror ramped up, there was so much work out there that everybody did everybody else's job. And it all kind of cross-promoted. And, we, you know, we, everybody was doing FID, everybody was doing direct action, freaking the regular army were running sources, and it, it, it was crazy. And it's just the way the war evolved. And the American military evolved very, very rapidly to, to meet that, you know, at the speed of war, as they say. So, um, 
the war in Iraq was not going well in 2006, and it was really not going well in 2007. Um, a lot of people on here are probably um, too young to remember, but there was bombings and killings daily, and, and the American public were becoming numb to it. And um, it was it was time to make a bold move, right? Now, the gloves did not come off in 06. They got loosened up quite a bit. In 07, they came off, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So we started training this unit. And the thing about working with the, the ERU with the Navy, that with the Navy it came, with the SEALs came EOD, Naval EOD, which were very good, completely different than Army EOD, very much better trained, part of, part of the special operations apparatus. And uh, those guys were really, really good. I can't remember if it was 06 or 07, it might have been 07, where we hit a target and we had a failed breach and we were maneuvering trying to go to a secondary breach point and our Navy EOD guy fell into an open uh, septic tank and was covered from head to toe in crap. And I felt so sorry for that guy. And he had to ride back in the helicopter. Nobody wanted to ride in the helicopter with him. He was... Uh, it It wasn't that bad for me. I stepped in. I threw a flashbang into a yard one time and I stepped through the door and I put my foot into an open sewer and I cracked my shin off the front of the, the concrete in the sewer. So now I had a cut shin and my foot, my leg was in sewage. And that was pretty disgusting. I, I, I want to chop my leg off. Um... The uh, so yeah, Navy EOD were great. The uh, we and we got some good assets and some good capability with the Navy. Uh, everybody has different personalities, and even within SF, every group has a different personality. It's very distinctive when you look for it. Um, the um, and and the naval kind of way of doing things in the army were, were different right we were kind of older and more more experienced and had more deployments than them but they you know they did a good job and, and they were good guys um we had some friction but we got over it the so we started teaching them we started assessing them which is normally what you do go in and do an assessment on cqb on driving on planning and they were pretty weak because they hadn't been enabled so they were carrying ak-47s with rails on them we were told they had m4s we were told they had mp5s we were told they had benelli shotguns but we could not track them down eventually we got into their arms room and we found them and they were mostly missing probably stolen and um by whom i don't know so we we ran uh AK-47s, which are a nightmare to do CQB with. But um, we got them flashlights for the guns. We got them night vision goggles, which were like seven Bravos, but kind of not great, but good enough for government work. We got them lasers for their weapons. They had <coughs> big white armored police vans, super tactical, and they had Land Rovers, like 110 Land Rovers armored, but the turret had no armor on it. So Mike and I went to this uh, armor welding facility on post and we bribed the guys to put armor on the on the turret like a shield like a glass armor i think i have pictures of that i'll try to find them um we bribed them with taking them we said we'll take you to the range we let you shoot all our guns and all that kind of thing so these kids worked their ass off and got us the stuff when it was all done we actually came back and brought them to the range and let them shoot all our guns and throw flashbangs and all kinds of stuff and they were like oh everybody Everybody says they're going to do that, but nobody actually does it. Uh, you guys are the first ones to actually come back and do that. So it was kind of cool. The um, Those Land Rovers were very, very top-heavy, especially with that turret. Um, the wide, the, the wheelbase wasn't really long, really wide, like a, like a Humvee, so they were prone to turn over. And um, that's why, like, some of the... Some of the the photos I have, especially in 07, I have a very slick kit. I have my, my weapon, my pistol mounted on my chest because if if a vehicle like that rolls over, you have a second to jump down in, otherwise you get chopped in half and you don't want stuff around your waist that's going to restrict your ability to drop down. Uh, we took him out driving. I remember me and Mike taking him out driving with night vision goggles up and down these roads inside the base trying to teach him how to drive with nods on, night vision goggles. Um, excuse me. We took him to the range. We did a lot of CQB with him. We took him out to our base outside Baghdad um, for a week 
and we there was live fire ranges there there was convoy live fire ranges there was shoot houses it's actually a really cool facility the facility was run by the iraqi army the chow hall was run by the iraqi army all the security was iraqi army but the ranges were run by an american contract company i can't remember which one so we get there we li- liaise with the guy, get the accommodation. It's very important when you do that foreign internal defense that Jay said, that building rapport, that, you know, by, with, and through, that you you don't put yourself above the people you're working with, right? What I mean by that is we slept in the same area. We ate the same chow. And then a chow hall there was an Iraqi chow hall. And the, the cooks or whoever were stealing all the food, so the, the food was crap. And the cleanliness wasn't good either. There was an American contractor chow hall on the base. And um, some of the Navy guys actually ate there. We did not eat there because that's a catastrophic loss for a poor. They know that, right? How do you know how hard to push your soldiers to push training if you're not eating the same food as them? So we sat there every day and ate the same garbage they did. I got the shits for like a week, but it, 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 it was worth it. And it had to be done. And we built a bond with those guys in that week that really pays off when you're in gunfights later on with them, right? Um, did a bunch of training there. Hit, hit an IED on the way back, but that's another story. Um, let me think. Yeah, those those vehicles were interesting to hit targets with. Not quick to get out of. Strikers are phenomenal in that, in that environment. But in the back of a Land Rover, I remember like we would get them to drive and we would be the, the vehicle commander. And then later on, we got in the back and let them be the vehicle panther and the driver. And you're in the back of this enclosed armored Land Rover with a bunch of sweaty guys that are all smoking. And it was brutal. It was, it was not fun. At one point, we were coming off target. And they said, hey, they're, they're, we had prisoners. And they were all flex cuffed and they had hoods on. And uh, they were like, hey, this guy's got to piss. And I'm like, I don't care. Uh, whatever. Uh and they're like, you know, he's going to piss in the vehicle. And I was like, look, we're not stopping. And uh, they're like, oh, we have a bottle here. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to ask. And then we stopped for something on the way. And I said, does that get, so he still got to piss? And they're like, no, no, he's good. And his hands were flex cuffed behind his back. So I'm like, I'm not even going to ask how that happened. I don't want to know. Um, the, let me think. Um, the intelligence on that on those that trip was not great, right? Later on, working with JSOC, getting that intel was phenomenal. But we were getting the intelligence from the Iraqi police, and it was hit or miss. Sometimes we rolled bad guys up. Sometimes it was great, and sometimes it was just garbage, right? And you, after doing hundreds of hits, you really got to know when you hit a target and you breach the door and you go in and you shoot a shocked look on people's face that they have no idea why you're there, and. Um, we hit this target one time and I got that. We, we went in and I looked at the woman. We didn't shoot anybody, but and she was just shocked. And it turned out later on, we found out that the guy had sold a car to the ERU commander and it was a lemon and this was payback. Not unusual. It was not unusual for them to steal, both the Iraqi counter-terrorist force and these guys to steal everything on target that wasn't nailed down. Um, but you used to chew her ass and say, don't steal the intel, right? Don't steal that you know, written paper, don't steal phones, don't steal hard drives. We need that. That's intelligence. But they were supplementing their income all the time, and it was just part of the culture. One of the other cool things about working with the Navy is they had twin 240 machine guns, 240 belt-fed machine gun, and they had a mount that we didn't have that had two machine guns mounted on it. One fed the belt from the right, one fed it from the left. And uh, I gunned on that thing a couple of times, and I'd been out once, as the gunner, and we didn't hit anything, and I was dying to shoot it. Um, another time I was out, and I was the rear vehicle, so I had the, the turret turned around covering the rear, and we passed an intersection in Baghdad, an RPG flew right past my vehicle and hit the wall, and what happened was they were trying to time it, they were down an alleyway, and they shot, and they, they'd mistimed it, missed me, and the Spectre gunship that we had overhead smoked them within seconds, had a 105 round on them. And that was the cool thing about working with JSOC too, was the assets that you had stacked up, especially in 07. Anything we needed, we got. Tanks, armor, boats, Apache gunships. We never left a wire without a Spectre gunship over the top of us, which is a super reassuring thing because they see a lot and they can pinpoint accurately fire. Um, it, 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 for those who don't know, a Spectre gunship is an AC-130. It's a big cargo plane with an artillery piece sticking out of the side. Um, 
It shoots a 40 mic mic. It shoots a Gatling gun, and it, it, it can precision fire. And there's a whole crew on board um, watching everything goes on in high-speed cameras and thermals. It, it, it's a phenomenal asset over your head. It doesn't work very well if the enemy have... Uh, ground to air, but they didn't have there, so they, it could fly very, very effectively. And it only flies at night. Um, I have a picture there. I'm going to put on my on the YouTube channel of Mike re-enlisting during that trip. He's standing re I'm standing behind him, holding the American flag. Generally, you can re-enlist wherever you want in the army. Within reason, I re-enlisted the next year on target in a, in a terrorist house. Um, but me and me and Mike worked hand in hand on that 06 trip and we worked our ass off. We trained all day and then we hit targets at night. And then we got back really, really late. We went back, we went to bed for a couple of hours, got up the next day and did it again and again and again. Despite growing up in violence, these guys were not very violent. They not very aggressive. They did not like to fight physically, right? So we taught them combatives. We tried to build that aggression. I had two of them boxing one time. And um, they were not hitting each other. And they were pretending. And I, you know, the one guy was saying to the other guy, oh, you don't hit me and I won't hit you. And I speak enough Arabic to understand what he was saying. So I was like, look, guys, you either fight him or you're going to fight him. And I pointed over at Mike, who was doing combatives with another guy. Mike's a pretty tough guy. And then this, these guys are messing around, not doing it, not doing it. I'm like, Mike, come over here and fight this guy. Mike's like, okay. And Mike didn't even know why. And he gets in there and starts boxing with this guy. And then within like 10 seconds, Mike and him are beating the crap out of each other. And um, the guy's fighting for his life. And he learned quickly. It's funny because that, that brings up a story. In 05, when I was working with the Iraqi army, I was doing CQB at the shoot house. And we had a blower suit. And a big, you know, the big protective suits. And generally, you know, they hit it and you have somebody in the blower suit come out and grab one of them so they can practice taking him down. Well, there was a big, huge guy with the Iraqi army who said, I'll put the suit on, right? In pointy talking language, right? And so he put the suit on and I put him in the room and he comes in and he just starts messing people up. And it gets to a point where there's no training value anymore. So he's just throwing people. And he's a big dude. He's just throwing people left and right. And, and I come in to stop it. And he pushes me away. And I'm like, oh, no, you didn't. And I jump up on his back. And I put him in a chokehold. And it was like Princess Bride, man, with the giant, with the guy on his back. And he's flailing around. And I put a chokehold on him hard. And I put him out. He went unconscious, <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit, probably shouldn't have done that. And then they were all like, oh, my God. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, sorry, that's, that's a flashback. Um, the uh, One of the things we did in 06 and 07, and, again, we had EOD, Navy EOD with us. If we hit a target with a bad guy, got in a gunfight, and we, we didn't want to leave his assets in place, right? So we would burn his vehicle. And one time we hit a target, and there was a bunch of bad guys on it, and we killed them all, and they had killed a bunch of civilians and dug a mass grave with a big bulldozer. So we burned the bulldozer before we left, and they had a truck as well, like a flatbed truck. And the Navy EOD guy put a thermite grenade in the truck, and it, it, he put it in the cab. And then we ran and we get on the helicopter. We were flying away. And we looked down and it had burned a hole through the floor of the cab onto the ground. And then they just pushed the vehicle off it. So they had their truck. They kept their truck. And he was like, damn it, I should have put it on the engine block. But they, they kept their truck. Just had a big, massive hole in, in the floor. Um, the other thing we had to do in 05 and 06 were shooter statements. Basically, if you shot someone in combat, you had to come back and write up a statement, name, location, incident, report, write the whole thing up, right? We didn't have to do that in 07, but in 05 and 06, we did. Now, in 06, the first time I had to do that was a big gunfight, and there was a bunch of us there, and one of the guys on my team said, look, don't put your real name on it. And I was like, I got nothing. I didn't do anything wrong. Why do I care? And he was like, I'm telling you, don't. And I thought about it for a second. I was like, yeah, you're right. Now, if we look at what goes on now, years and years later, they're prosecuting British soldiers who shot people in Northern Ireland during Bloody Sunday in 1972. They're in their 80s and 90s now. Now, I'm not saying they did right, and I'm not, but by God, if they're going to come after people 50 years later, um, what is the chances that some 
liberal organization would go back to Iraq, talk to people in these back streets, get their skewed, one-sided side of the story, look at shooter statements that are probably freaking Freedom of Information Act, and then come after you to prosecute you. So that's not what I was thinking at the time. I just took advice from somebody. And so I'm not saying I did it. I am saying that the office was pretty popular in 2006. And Michael Scott, Dwight Schrute, Andy Bernard, um, Jim Halpert shot a lot of people in Iraq in 2006. Just saying. Um the what else the that was a great trip we learned a lot we got in a lot of gunfights and but you're still maneuvering in ditch right you're still herding cats and you can't you can only go at their speed right you have to we used to pull up in the trucks and we'd sprint me and mike and jason and Dave, we'd sprint from the vehicles to the breach point as fast as we could you're teaching them aggression right get up there put a charge and boom breach the door and get in um and we were trying to build that aggression. So we, we were often first in the house, but you have to hand it over to them and let them take the lead um, to build up their capabilities and build up their confidence and let them take over their own security in their own damn country, okay? So again, all night missions, all pretty good assets, a um, lot of gunfights, but still maneuvering an indigenous force, which is is kind of holds you back a little bit. All right. Um, okay, let me push on. Let me see if I missed anything. Okay, so got back, left uh, there. It was about a six month tour. Got back to the states. Went to sniper school. Um, as a, as a Civ sniper guy, you get priority. So Fardic is actually set up and run or was then to feed the assaulters to the CIF companies. Yeah. Some guys on other ODAs got into Sephardic, but mostly you have to sign a document saying, I understand that this course is for the CIF companies and I am willing to go to the CIF company if needed. Now, we had no problem recruiting because we were in, in it at that point, but um, SODIC sniper school for special forces, the special forces sniper course. It used to be called SODIC, and you'll hear it called SODIC periodically, and I still call it that sometimes, but that was the special operations target interdiction course. Um, there was supposed to be two level one snipers on each team. And it's hard to get that, but they're not actual snipers. It's an additional duty. So it's one of 20 skills they have, and they don't do it all the time. The SIF companies are the only place that had de designated sniper teams who that was their job. Now, we were also assaulters, and we did all a ton of other stuff. We were actually snipers. Um, so th it's a nine-week special forces sniper course, and it's set up for Ranger Regiment, Delta Force, and uh, special forces snipers. That's who goes to it. There was a Navy SEAL officer in mine, actually, a really good guy, uh, but that's, that's very, very rare. I've never seen a foreign student there. The when you go there, I'd already been to I've already been to sniper school in in Ireland. I'd already been on sniper missions in Ireland. I'd already employed my sniper rifle in Afghanistan and Iraq, and so I was fairly experienced. And I'd been to Todd Hodnett's, so I was fairly on top of my game. And I went there, and I went to sniper school in Ireland in like eighty seven or eighty eight. And I went there in 2007, and it hadn't really changed. There were still minutes of angle and mills and milling targets and data books, and hadn't really changed. And we'll talk about modern R. I'll talk about modernizing it later on when I got there as an instructor. But for then, it didn't change. But I was in there, cooperate and graduate, right? There was some advancements in the school. They had started shooting gas guns, uh, body armor helmets, alternate positions, running and gunning type stuff, urban hides, but it still had a long way to go. But it was a cool school. It was really, really cool. And I had an absolute blast. So I got sniper qualified. Um, I had to go to a leadership school too. I had to go to what's called the senior leader course. It was when you're an E7, you have to go to this. I think that's what it was. And it was for soft. So it was all Green Berets. And it came from all over the country. And then they came to the school. And I tried to put it off and put it off. And I got to the point where like, you're going, whether you like it or not. So it was like, six weeks, I think, but it was in Bragg, so it wasn't like I had to travel anywhere. And again, I'm between deployments, and I'm trying to rebuild that family life a little bit. Uh, you know, you come home, you take leave, you go to Disney, you try to reconnect your kids, 
and then you're back training in schools and training in schools and training in schools and then you're, you're deployed again. It was just the way life was. But I remember I was at that school and, you know, I've been to a lot of good schools in the army and I've been to a lot of crappy schools, but I always learned something. If you apply yourself, you're always going to learn something. But on that one, I really didn't apply myself. I did the bare minimum and it's not like me, but I was just, I don't know. I wasn't motivated for that school. We did uh, uh, one of the practical exercises we had to do was we had to, they broke us up into five man teams, and we had to build a concept, a training concept, and brief it to the commander. Um, excuse me. So you know the other guys were from out of town, so they really had no life. They were there staying in a hotel. And you weren't allowed to do, work on it during the day because you had other classes. So they would be like, hey, we'll meet at Barnes & Noble at 8 o'clock and we'll we'll work on it for a couple of hours, right? And just take the time. And I'd be like, hey, my kid's got soccer practice, man. I can't do that. I got stuff going on. They're like, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And they did this a couple of times. And, of course, I was never there. <laughs> and uh, when it came to the day to brief, I was like, what are we doing? And it was uh, life tissue training. It was a, a medical training training concept that we were briefing. And they're like, I was not involved, so I had no idea. So they're like, you just briefed the introduction. So I get up there and I just BS that I was like, I was, yeah, the medic can get ch killed with the first round. Everybody needs medical training, survival of the force, blah, blah, blah. And they did their briefing and each one of them briefed a section of this. And at the end, the commander was like, that's awesome. You guys did a great job. Sarno no, and your introduction was fantastic. So I basically got all the credit and did none of the work. What a dirt bag. Um, the blister show up and all the hard work's done. But that's not how I roll normally. Um, I would say that was an anomaly, but I just had no interest. But it was still a good school and I still learned a lot. Uh, went back to Iraq in 07 and the surge had kicked in. So the surge, if people just remind people, was... At a certain point in war, you gotta you gotta shit to get off the pot, man. You gotta freaking surge. You gotta take it seriously, or you gotta get out, right? Or it just drags on and drags on and drags on if you're half-assing it. That's kind of what happened in Afghanistan, and you know, you know, getting out and making it worse. But in Iraq, at a certain point, the Bush administration said they're gonna surge massive amount of troops in, and at the time, I thought it was stupid because they already taught me too many troops there, and but it actually worked. So I was wrong. So the surge happened in 07, and they just flooded the place. Now, for us, it wasn't a big deal because we were going anyway. The real heartbreaking story was for infantry units or that were there for a year fighting and were ready to go home, some of which were at the airport, and they were stopped and sent back into combat for six more months. Some had already rotated home, and they were sent back. I remember hearing about a kid who had rotated home, was sent back, and got killed. So they were there for 18 months. There was a unit in uh, Baghdad in 06 when me and Mike were there. We went home. We trained. We prepped. We were home for like eight months. We came back, and they were still there. That's hard, man. 18 months is a brutal deployment. The longest deployment I ever had in the U.S. military, I was in nine months in Kosovo, and I was nine months in Mosul. Everything else was only six months. So when people say, oh, I have six deployments or 10 deployments or eight deployments, they're really not the number of deployments, it's the length of the deployments. One 18-month deployment to combat is brutal, and that will wear your ass down mentally and physically after time, over time. So we got back. So the, the surge, basically, the plan was to flood the place with troops. In Baghdad, you had units in every neighborhood. They knew every, it was to give the, bad guys nowhere to go so there was this whole political strength the awakening and people were going to get on board and kind of in the background you had guys like me going out on kill capture missions every single night and when we got there we got briefed McChrystal was in charge at that point of the ah, and he basically we got briefed and said look the, the gloves are off go do what you gotta do and go kill these guys because we were losing the war and the, both in 06 and 07 I don't know if the gloves were loosened in 06 or I was just working with a higher tiered element and we were given more latitude but in 07 we were given a lot of latitude and we were doing unilateral ops no indage half, our whole company went half worked with the Iraqi counter-terrorist force and half my half went and worked with the strike task force 
strike team, high value targets, kill capture missions every night, reverse cycle, bed down location, go get them. Um, so it was, <clears throat> was really the pinnacle of my career because it, it seemed like everything I'd done to that point was leading to that point. So here's a typical day, and, and Mike at this point was on my team. Before, we worked together in uh, with ERU, but he was actually on an assault team attached, but then now he was on my team. And we would, me and Mike would get up in the morning. We had nobody to train. All it was was just missions and missions and missions and missions. Um, we'd get up uh, in the afternoon, actually, because we'd be out all night, we go get some chow, come back, get a briefing, prep our gear, either go in helicopters or boats or vehicles, hit a target, sometimes flex to two, three, four, five targets that night, come back, do an after action review, eat breakfast, go to bed. That was our routine for months and months. Working with that top highest tier of the US military, the intelligence was fantastic. I don't think we ever got bad intel. They knew exactly who we were going after, how many people were on target. Um, it was phenomenal. And then, you know, when you're in Afghanistan and you are working an area of operation, which is massive, you hit a target, you pull the intel, you sift through all the intel, you try to find another, you're doing everything yourself. In JSOC, we went, we hit targets, we filled... Um, bags with, with intel. We came back, we dropped off prisoners, we dropped off the intel, and we went to bed. And then these intel guys, these intel analysts, my son is an intel analyst, but they, they love it, right? They, they look at it as like, a, like a, a puzzle. They get in and they sift through everything. And, and I'm sure we brought them receipts for bread and all kinds of stuff. I mean, we didn't speak Arabic, right? We just pulled up every piece of paper we could find. Um, but we were trained in, in sensitive flight exploitation. It's called, we, we pulled all the stuff in. They came in, they sifted through it. Um, pocket letter on the prisoners, photographs to the prisoners, photographs of dead people. Um, they went through all that and built target packets for us. All we had to do was go get them and go kill capture, right? Um, if we were rolling in vehicles, we rolled in strikers. And strikers are uniquely suited for that city thing and, and there was a lot of scrutiny Shinseki was the German and Joint Chiefs at the time I think around 2000 before 9-11 and he was the one who brought on the striker brigades he's also the one that took the, the Black Beret from the Ranger Regiment and gave it to everybody in the army like that's going to increase their capability because they have a piece of cloth on their head um, I think that the, the sand coloured beret that, that the Ranger Regiment end up getting the same colours the SDS I thought it looked better anyway but um, the he but he brought on the striker brigades as a light force, <clears throat> wheeled vehicles, armor to get troops into the battlefield. Now Bradley does that, but the Bradley's big, chunky, uh, tracked vehicle, um, not very agile, a lot of firepower, but super uncomfortable to ride in. If you've ever ridden in the back of a Bradley fighting, it is brutal. It's noisy. It's smelly, and it's cramped. The striker. Because I had a mechanized infantry background, this striker was like a Rolls Royce. It was big, roomy, air conditioned, and not that loud. So <clears throat> it, it could roll into the city. It had a crow system, a remote weapon system up top, um, two air guards in the back. And of course, there, there's always this uh, kind of debate on whether putting guys up in an air guard, guard position is the right idea, right? Because you're very vulnerable to IEDs and small arm fires but you increase the situational awareness of the vehicle. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a judgment call depending on where you are. But if we rolled, we rolled in strikers. We had tanks with us. Again, every asset you could possibly conceive, we had. Um, we want to roll into, into a part of the city, especially Solder City, tanks. Abrams tanks, uh, Bradley fighting vehicles, um, Apache gunships, Spectre gunship every single mission. Uh, anything we needed. We even had boats. Like, we did, I did two boat missions in Baghdad, which, those Swick boats, um, <clears throat> I can't remember what the name of them are, but they have miniguns and, you know, Mark 19s, twin 240s, like a lot of guns and a FLIR system, infrared, um, thermal camera on it. And they haul ass, and they're for shallow water. So we actually did two missions where we loaded helicopters, flew to an island, got on the boats. The boat took off real slow, and then it just hauled ass up the Tigris River. 
came in, hit the berm up, grabbed the guy back in the boat, back back again. Um, when we when we got briefed that, hey, we're going to take boats here, me and my buddy were like, this is stupid. Who came up with this? This is just dumb. And then when it was over, we were like, that was pretty cool, man. That was awesome. It was really, really cool missions. Um Little birds. We had little birds with skids on them, so you could be you could be sitting on the on the skid on the little bird, flying into an objective and, and landing on a rooftop, lip landing. Um, I remember getting the brief, and those pilots are just a cut above. They're the best of the best. And I remember getting a briefing out there, and we were training, we were fast roping on the little birds, and the pilot was like, "Hey, if we're coming in on target, and you see bad guys, open fire." We don't have any guns on this thing. And some of the little birds had rockets and mini guns, but not these, not the ones carrying troops. So he was like, please open fire. Don't look for permission, just do it because you're the only guns we have. Um, but the, the capability to come in hard and put troops wherever you needed and have that, to be able to fly in on a target sitting on the on the skid of a little bird with preemptive fire hitting that that was just an insane amount of assets to bring to bear to the fight. And we got briefed by the Delta. We were on a task force with Delta Force, British SAS and us. And we'd all separate targets. We didn't work together, but we all did the same mission. And uh, we just rotated. And and we were mostly out every night. Sometimes we were out. We hit target to target to target, multiple hits during the night. Um, and, And we we were given a lot of latitude to go after these guys and we were briefed you know we changed our tactics techniques and procedures midway through and we got briefed by the delta force commander and he was like look it takes millions of dollars to train you guys and i can't replace you that quickly we're changing to this and it was the right call i'm getting into it but um when we uh one of the missions we did and, and i can't read it 60 or 70 missions that trip but one of the missions we did was, uh, Mike has talked about this before, and, I, and me and Mike did a podcast specifically on this mission. So if you want the details, you go back into Fieldcraft Survival, and it's called The Dogs of War. We probably did it 18 months ago. My dog, Vinny, uh, my service dog, is named after a dog that we had on a mission in the outskirts of Baghdad. I can't remember where it was, but uh, we came in one night, and we were told, our intel was like, hey, there's like a dozen foreign fighters on this target. They have a, a heavy machine gun mounted in a vehicle. They shot down an American helicopter with it. Bad dudes. We come in. We offset in the desert a little bit. We walk in. And before we get into position, all hell breaks loose. And they open fire. And it turned out, I think there was 14 uh, fighters on target. All foreign fighters. They all wearing suicide vests. And they were there to fight. When we came up on target, we're kind of in an L shape. Mike was kind of at the ape, at the, the joint of the, the elbow of the L. I was further on that right side. And when the gunfight started, I was like, oh, I, I had a perfect vantage point on the back of the building. And I thought, I'll get the squirters running out, heading for the wood line, and nobody ran. And the boys were there to fight. We pulled, we, we got a massive gunfight. At one point, the uh, the commander said, hey, we're going to pull back and hit, drop some 105 runs on it, run, do some minigun runs with the little birds, fire some rockets. So as we're moving back, we took fire from a, a heavy machine gun on a vehicle about a mile away, maybe, maybe, maybe a thousand meters away. Very hard to tell. But the rounds, some of them were tracers, and they flew right past my head. And me and my buddy hit the dirt. And as soon as I looked up, there was a little bird banking in that direction and fired 2.75-inch rockets into it. They got one burst off, and then it was all over. Um, we pulled back. We dropped some artillery from the... Uh, we dropped some 105s from the Spectre gunship, did some minigun runs, fired some rockets. The 105s we fired, it had rained and the ground was wet and they were hitting into a very soggy ground. They weren't doing a lot of damage. I and mean, we didn't know this at the time. So when we swept back up the second time, we got a massive gunfight again. Um, at one point, uh, guys were sweeping forward, throwing hand grenades and shooting because there was a guy kind of hidden in these palm groves and Mike was there. And uh, as they were moving forward, the dog handler was like, let's send the dog, Vinny. So he sends Vinny in. Vinny gets the scent, jumps on the guy. Guy detonates a suicide vest, kills the dog. Um, I'll never forget the handler's voice screaming, Vinny! I could hear the emotion in his in his voice when he was yelling. Um, we sweep up again. Um, 
uh, after that we pull back and then we start firing uh, 105s and airbursting them to do more damage and that got that did a lot at this point the whole place is on fire we, sh we fired a thermobaric law rocket into the vehicle at the front of the house and blew it to pieces um and uh, yeah the whole place is on fire we sweep up again um and then we sweep across the objective and kill all these guys headshots and suicide vests on headshots generally we sweep up and i remember getting up to the building and looking in and they had a pkm machine gun mounted inside one of the rooms pointed at the front door waiting for us had we hit that target with with the you know traditional assault we would have lost a lot of guys um there was a crink off like one of those little ak-47s like all silver hanging inside the window and there was no glass obviously so i was like oh that's cool that's a cool little souvenir i couldn't bring it home but i was like let me get that and i was like oh no i'm not reaching in there pull that could be booby trapped um so I, we swept across the objective got on the old tail counted all the bodies and when we were done we pulled back and we went and retrieved Vinny's body from the uh, palm groves we put him on a stretcher uh, one of the guys put a u.s flag on him and we put him in the helicopter and took his body back with us when we landed back at biop there was two lines of sas and, and and delta force operators lining the route and all came to attention and saluted as we took the dog off the bird it was heartbreaking um, but he did his job his job was to save lives and he did years later i was at the uh, special operations museum in, in fort in, in Fayetteville, North Carolina. If you're ever driving down I-95, like to New, from New York to Florida or, or vice versa, it's worth a detour off I-95 to go into Fayetteville, North Carolina and see the Special Operations and Airborne Museum. It's a phenomenal museum. Really, really worth seeing. But there's a, you know, I pulled up there years later and my kids were, were kind of playing outside. My wife was looking around. There's some exhibits outside. I was on the phone and my wife came back and she said, there's a, a memorial there for all the dogs that got killed in combat. And I'd never told my wife or my kids anything that happened in combat. I, I just, I did not want to bring them into that world. I, it was completely separated from me. Um, the, and I said, is there a name played on there? It says, Vinny. And she was like, I don't know. And we went over and we looked and it was there. And I started telling the story and I tears were on my eyes when I was telling the story. It's very, very emotional. It's hard for me to talk about it even now. Um, dogs are, are, are they're so phenomenal we, we don't deserve dogs we, we just don't they're phenomenal um i remember one time mm, again context is everything right uh, on a roof in baghdad with night vision goggles in curfew with people maneuvering on you uh people get shot and you know um I'll talk about this when I when I get to being a, an inst a, a first sergeant at the Warrior Leader course later on. But you know, you talk about rules of engagement, and I've brought this up again and again because I've dealt with it in Ireland along the border. I dealt with it in Lebanon, I dealt with Somalia, I dealt with Afghanistan and Iraq, and and the rules of engagement change, right? So basically, if you say you can't shoot unarmed people, that's good. I agree with that, right? We're not them. However, what is somebody running towards a blocking position in the middle of the night? in a gunfight with no visible weapon, but they might have a suicide vest on. To me, that's a no-brainer. That guy gets shot. And that has happened to me, right? Um, the, the, the rules of engagement are you you determine hostile intent, not your team sergeant and not your commander and not freaking Congress. You do it right there and then, split-second decision, and you take care of business, right? Um, I, I had a guy appear like four feet in front of me on a blocking position in the middle of the night on a back alley very dark away from the fight but we were covering the, the rear of the of the, the hit and we were on the street and i was back in the shadows with buildings on one side cars and then a sidewalk and the guy appeared on the sidewalk armed like three feet four five feet in front of me and i shot him in the chest and he fell behind a car and we used to load ball ammunition and green tip into the same mag alternating because ball ammunition we ran a lot of 77 grand ball ammunition gives you that good terminal effect on tissue 
And green tape gives you the ability to push through car windows and engine blocks and stuff like that. So it kind of was something we did. And I hit him with a green tape around that went right through him and he fell behind a car and he stood back up like a zombie in a movie. And I shot him like 10 more times, right? And I break this up sometimes when I talk about ballistics and, and, and you know, uh, shot placement and what happens with different rounds on target. Um, the That trip was, I remember that the, the Delta commander making a statement during that trip saying, Al-Qaeda in Iraq will be done by the end of the year. And I thought that was a very bold, irresponsible statement. He didn't put it out publicly. He said it to us. And I, I was like, wow, but it actually did happen. By the end of 07, we had pushed Al-Qaeda out of Baghdad and up into Mosul. And then the task force went in a way and chased them into Mosul and pushed them out of the country. Basically, it's phenomenal. And the people just were sick of fighting and they wanted to take their country back. We pulled up one time early on in that trip and the ramp went down and an RPG flew past the ramp. We're like, oh shoot, it's on. We grabbed ladders and we had to maneuver through a couple of blocks because you couldn't get the vehicles in close enough. We got up on the roof and uh, I had a 10 inch M4. And I, I think I told this to Grand Thumb when I was on his thing, but I had a 10 inch M4 and I was fighting. People were shooting at us from like six different positions. And uh, eventually they were probing, trying to figure out where we were. And eventually, I fired back, which gave a massive flame off the end of that gun and drew fire from all six positions on us, which was dumb. I should have known better than that. So I never went on the roof again without a suppressor. But that exact same time, I was shooting at a guy and I was leaned over the edge of the building shooting at him. And my brass was coming out and it was landing on a guy sleeping in another subroof below us. And he was getting annoyed that my brass was hitting him. He's trying to sleep. He wasn't annoyed about the gunfight that Ryan's in his house. He was annoyed that the brass was hitting him. And he um, he was losing sleep. This is how numb you get to combat sometimes. Um, but uh, phenomenal trip. Did a lot of building climbing on that trip. We used to pull up in the vehicles. Pull while the guys were getting the ladder off. Me and Mike Glover would climb the building solo, just free free climb it, and basically have everybody flex cuff. By the time the guys got up there, uh, we'd also I remember Mike, myself and Mike running and jumping from rooftop to rooftop in Baghdad, on their nods, um, four stories up, jumping a rooftop. They were like insane. We were hunting, and we were predators at that point, and we did a lot of damage. Um, okay, so there's so much more I could say about that and so many more stories, um, but I'll leave it for another time. Came back from that trip in 07, came back um, and prepped to go back down range in 2008 with the Iraqi counter-terrorist force snipes. So we trained up the rest of 07. I think we came back right before Christmas. So into 08, got trained and trained and trained. And then I come down on the levee for SWIC. SWIC is the Special Warfare Training Center um, where the schoolhouses are. And generally the way it works is if you've been on a team for a couple of years and you're a senior guy, then this list comes down and they tag you, how are you going to swick? And I'm like, you freaking can't get out of it. So I went to my company, Sean Major, and I was like, I want to go to this trip with the Iraqi counter terrorists, four snipes. And they're like, oh, they're waiting for you at sniper school. And, you know, you got to go. So I went out to the sergeant major at sniper school. It was Pete Gold at the time. And I, I don't know Pete. And I said, hey, I want to go. I want to defer my, my swick tour for a couple of months so I can go down range and Pete was like go shoot people in the face and come back your job will be here when you come back and I was like yes so I went back to my company's harm major and he was like he refused to change the orders and I was pissed so I went to I went to SWIC for a tour and it's a three year tour and I went kicking and screaming and I hated leaving my team but I went to sniper school for three years became a very competitive shooter became the NCOIC, the non-commissioned officers in charge of sniper school, and uh, really, really had a great time. And it gave me part of the reason, I, I, I think, that I have not had all these PTSD issues that people, some people have had, is I got to take that break in the middle of combat, right? Number one, I got to take a break. I got to take a knee. Um, number two, I don't drink. And number three... I came right out of the army and straight into another job at Fieldcraft, which is almost like being in the army sometimes. Um, and I, I think those things help me. So I'm going to pick it up next time at the start of sniper school. And uh, yeah, we'll roll on. I appreciate everybody listening.
Um, check out philcroftsurvival.com slash training. I am teaching ballistics this weekend. Uh, we teach land nav. And look at the end of February. We are doing a bug out planning course. I don't really like the term bug out. Emergency evacuation, right? If you had to leave your house because of a wildfire, because of you know a new a chemical leak, because of certain things. Now, obviously, everybody wants to lock down and stay home, and I do too. But if you had to leave, what would you take with you? What would you leave? Um, what are your routes? Where would you go? What does your bug out bag look like? How, what do you put in your car? Where do you send? Where do you get medications? All these types of things. We're going to do a two day planning exercise that's like super cheap because it's the first time we did it and we're going to walk through that whole thing and do some PEs and I got some senior senior special operations uh, guys um, helping us run that course so it's going to be really really cool here in North Carolina so and then look at all the classes we teach throughout the country and please come train with us okay guys until the next time thank you bye